Hello, Vinny Salazar, and thanks for accepting my invitation for this interview for the Reproducible Research Scout YouTube channel. Let's start with your introduction. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invite. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to note that Honey Eddie was at my first, like my first uh, contact with programming ever. That was in the SciPy 2016, we ha which happened at the university where I did my undergrad. Um, so yeah, it's nice to be here after all this time and to, to be able to talk about uh, reproducible research a little bit. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Melbourne at the School of Mathematics and Statistics. And my research is mainly related to bioinformatics, so research software in bioinformatics. And I think that's obviously very intimately related to reproducibility. Um, there's been a growing concern in this field and in most fields that have grown rapidly in recent years about having reproducible analysis and just using, putting best uh, practices to, to work and applying that to uh, our research. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to, to talk about reproducible research as I think it's a principle that uh, most scientists are, sh should, should care about in their, in their research. Thank you. Uh, so you already had sat describing uh, how do you define reproducible research and why is it important? Do you want to expand a little bit of on what you yeah, are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think there's two ways of um, understanding reproducible research. One would be a more conceptual way, um, such as, for example, the scientist's responsibilities to stakeholders, whether that's uh, taxpayers or just um, the, the funding bodies behind the research. So I think having reproducible research helps to, to keep the, the merit of and the value of the research because that goes into the second way we can see reproducible research, which would be the more practical way, because when we care about re reproducibility, it's much easier to, to replicate results and to rep replicate analysis. And I think as many fields, not only in the life sciences, which is what I work with, but in many fields across the sciences, uh, there's, I mean, most scientists, scientists sciences are becoming more computationally driven with a lot of uh, modeling and simulations and um, software development going on. So I think being able to reproduce that is of great value, is uh, it's, it's something fundamental to the research practice. When you see an analysis, when you see a model or software that you uh, think it's interesting, whether it's in the literature or a preprint, uh, and you want to apply that yourself or to validate that yourself, to know how it works, uh, the people, the group that put in that work must, if, if they didn't ensure that was reproducible, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to be able to replicate that. So I think that speaks a little bit more about that practical way. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just say that combining this conceptual and the practical way, we can see reproducible research as a set of practices and concepts that we must, we must constantly apply and kind of plan our research around that. Uh, it, the reproducible research, it, it's, those practices are present in all cycles of scientific research from the initial planning of experiments um, or whatever is the objective of, of the, the study being conducted, all the way to the, um, to the publication, the validation, reproducible research practices are pr present in all of these uh, stages of the life cycle. So yeah, this, this is kind of my view. Um, I'm sure that there are more well-defined formal definitions, but yeah, this, this is sort of what I think.
Thank you, thank you for uh, your definition of reproducible research. I know that you are author of a uh, tool called BioProv, that's a provenance library for bioinformatics workflows. How do you define provenance? Yeah, so it's, it's nice to talk about BioProv, actually. Uh, that was my master's work. Uh, so that's the main component of my, my master uh, research thesis. And well, data provenance is a concept which I believe is ingrained within reproducibility. Uh, it's part of reproducibility and provenance is basically a concept which is bored from other fields. One thing that one field that I can think, think about provenance is art because like when pieces of art uh, which have historical value um, are sold in auctions or whatever, they, they come with a, a paperwork um, called the provenance of that work, like which, which uh, people have owned it and where it has passed through. Uh, so it's kind of a detailed uh, record of where it came from and how it arrived at the place that it is right now. So that kind of defines provenance being able to to track an artifact it's it's history it's path through time and space um, and we kind of borrowed that to to computational research to define data provenance as being able to monitor the path and the steps that have led to the creation of a particular data art artifact and bioprov was sort of um, an attempt, uh, um, a framework to try to apply the concepts of uh, data provenance to bioinformatics workflows, which is the, the main focus, I would say, of my research. And we did that under a web framework called the W3C prov uh, standard. And I kind of tried to apply using the W3C prov standards to uh, monitor data provenance in bioinformatics workflows. And the implementation of that was bioprov. That's very interesting. Uh, I personally have uh, always struggled with provenance. It's, uh, it's a constant challenge in my work of where the data is coming from and where the data is going out and what it's been doing between yeah we, and the, we must surely leave that to the machines because if we try to do that ourselves as humans is uh too difficult intensive and yeah a lot of labor to track it properly so we i think i guess we need to leave that one to the software and the packages that we use uh how much of common practice is provenance uh among your peers and how has been the adoption of bioprov um well that that's a very good question i think um reflecting on how provenance is incorporated i don't think is a term that is as widely known as for example reproduce reproducibility i think provenance is a bit more niche let's say but i think when when researchers are employing reproducible research practices to their work they are already doing some sort of something to, to track the provenance of their data, whether it's to just keep the log files of the, the analysis that you run, or um, even just tracking the, ver the versions of the software that you use, of the packages that you use, that's already can be considered some sort of provenance practice, right? Um, but I think it's, uh, data provenance monitoring is put to practice like in these different ways um i would say that in terms of incentives for researchers to become more concerned with that and apply that more to their work i think it really depends on I guess one of the main incentives in, in academia is, for example, publication. So if, if journals require that for a study that is based mostly on computational analysis, that there is a proper 
like uh, log of that analysis or the code is available. The note, the some some people use tools called notebooks to record their data analysis process process. So if those sort of act artifacts are available, they can be helpful in tracking the provenance of the final data. So I, I feel that, for example, if these venues such as journals kind of enforce that and require that, that gives a, an incentive for researchers to apply that. And for the second part uh, about the adoption of Bioprov, um, there hasn't really been much, but honestly, it's because I developed it mostly as a proof of concept. So kind of a, a theoretical concept on how that could work. And it was actually my first larger software engineering project that I kind of wrote a package from scratch all by myself. That wasn't like a, a small package with just a few scripts. It's sort of like a, a library, I guess I could call it uh, a library if, with many different components and such. So for me, it's, it was a bit of a trial and error experience, but I was happy with the final uh, software product, which allowed to, um, well, ap apply that proof of concept to, to some, some use cases. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't, um, heavily invested into spreading out about, about Bioprov, but yeah, some, sometimes now and then I, I get a, an email or a text for someone from someone that has been using it. And I'm, I'm always glad that they, they found it useful. And what I would really like to see in the future is some sort of plugin to, um, there are these tools called scientific workflow management systems. Two that are really popular right now in the bioinformatics community are Snakemake and Maxflow. So I guess I would really like to see a plugin for one of these management systems to generate the Bioprof output, but that's like an effort that I don't know, maybe it happens in the future. What are the names that you say? Snake? Snake make uh, and next flow. Next so flow. yeah, yeah. I will. These are two yeah. tools that they are super popular, all the rage in, in bioinformatics right now. Uh, yep. Have you been using any of those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I've been using a lot of snake make recently. Um, for my PhD project, uh, developing a few workflows in Snakemake. Um, I find it quite intuitive and it really helps to scale the analysis and to uh, be able to keep a proper record of my analysis and all of these things that we were discussing about provenance and reproducibility. So I guess that um, today, uh, we have so many excellent open source, free to use tools that help researchers to, to do that, that we surely should be using them. But I know that, like, I'm, I'm quite aware that there is a hurdle in terms of the learning curve to be able to use these tools efficiently. But yeah, I think it's a worthy investment for any researcher who has does a lot of computational analysis with many different steps is to maybe have a look at some of these workflow management systems that sounds very interesting something to explore more in future episodes do you have any plans to keep developing bioprov or is anyone uh, taking that further on the role uh not at the moment actually uh, i would like so there is only one major version. I would like to kind of not rewrite it from scratch, but put put um, put out another like full fledged major version. So maybe breaking some of the API, but really revamping the whole package. I think you would need that in order to to see a wider adoption. But yeah, I guess for that to happen. Um, like I would, I would love it if maybe I could find a, a, a grant or a small, some, some funding that could help me with that. But unless I find that sort of um, incentive, uh, I don't have any, any plans for it right now. It's okay. Uh, it happens with lots of uh, research software, right? It's the yeah. 
their fate in some sense. Uh, our time is running out. If there is any other project that you are involved and want to share with our audience? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, since we are talking about workflow, I have just put out a workflow based on Snakemake. I'm going to drop the link in the chat, maybe after uh, Honey Eddie can put this in the, the description. Yeah. Um, but that is very niche for like the bioinformatics, uh, especially specifically metagenomics analysis. So it's a metagenomics workflow that I've been developing. Um, so just something if by any chance any of the viewers work with with bioinformatics or metagenomics and maybe interest to, to have a look or anyone that's interested in snake make in general. And yeah, I'd just like to add that it has been a pleasure to be here to talk a little bit about my work. Uh, I think these sort of initiatives are crucial for us to discuss about reproducibility more and for that to gain a wider appeal in the scientific community. So yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for your time. And this was a very joyful conversation for me. I hope you have a good day and speak with you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Bye.